Today, Roger Stone joins us. He is a longtime political consultant known for his work with Nixon, Reagan, and Donald Trump. He was one of the subjects of the Mueller investigation into Russian collusion and connections with WikiLeaks. He was arrested, charged, convicted, and later pardoned. Roger has firsthand knowledge of bare-knuckle political fights in America and what it means to be a political target. Roger, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Uh, I am uh, delighted uh, to be here. Uh, you know, it is... Uh after everything I went through, the odyssey of being targeted by big government in an effort to uh, squeeze me into testifying falsely against the president, which I refused to do, uh, on November 3rd, 2020, at midnight, the busiest news day of the year, the, the uh, Department of Justice was forced to release the last remaining long redacted hidden sections of Robert Mueller's report in which even he couldn't sugarcoat the fact that he had, quote, no factual evidence against me for Russian collusion, WikiLeaks collaboration, uh, or any involvement in the phishing and publication of John Podesta's emails. So uh, it was a, a witch hunt. Uh, I thank uh, the good Lord to be alive today, only through the mercy and uh, justice and boldness of Donald Trump. Um, I think if one is a civil libertarian, uh, one has to be shocked at what's going on in our country in terms of free speech, in terms of censorship, uh, and in terms of the uh, abuses uh, by the intelligence agencies of our constitutional rights. You know, Roger, you've been in politics for a really, really long time, um, and you have been, you know, known for being part of, like I mentioned, the bare knuckle fighting in Washington and really getting into the nitty gritty there. Um, I'm curious, you know, because it, to me it has been very alarming seeing Donald Trump targeted and gone after to the level that he's been gone after. And I wasn't even, I didn't vote for Trump. I wasn't a supporter of his. But many of us who really have traditionally hailed from the left, but have been more on the anti-establishment, anti-war side, anti, you know, all this government surveillance and have been really, really alarmed by the treatment of Trump. And I'm curious, in all of your years of experience in Washington, I mean, and you were very, you were with Nixon. I hear you even have maybe a tattoo of him, which I want to get to. But um, have you seen anything like this ever in your political career? Someone targeted to the level that Trump was targeted? Uh, only uh, in the example of Richard Nixon uh, in Watergate. Look, we have recently relearned from classified documents, which has never before been disclosed, that the Central Intelligence Agency had advanced notice of the Watergate break-in, that they had infiltrated the burglar team, uh, and that this whole thing was essentially a government op. Uh, they wanted to take Nixon down because of the fundamental changes he was going to make in government. They were unhappy with his ending the Vietnam War. They were under, unhappy with the strategic arms limitation agreement that he reached with the Soviets. They were unhappy about the overture uh, to uh, uh, communist China at a time that China was a dirt poor agrarian society with more ox uh, than uh, cars. There was no way for Nixon to know that decades later, the Clintons uh, would give them uh, military intelligence and the, and the Bushes would give them uh, uh, most favored nation stating status, which made them the superpower that they are today. Uh, so uh, we know the intelligence agencies were deeply involved in the removal of Nixon. We know they were involved now based on the House uh, Select Committee on Assassinations in the removal of John Kennedy. Every disclosure that comes out uh, of these declassified documents continues to point in that direction. Uh, it's a very sad day because in the old days, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, if one was considered a liberal, one was for civil liberties and one was against war. What yeah. I understand is these people who seem to uh, not be concerned at all about the, uh, the lack of privacy, the government spying, the censorship, uh, and the tens of billions of dollars of money that we are shipping to endless foreign wars, the latest one being uh, in Ukraine. Uh, look, I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin. They will say that I am. I am not. He is a thug. It is an authoritarian system. But we signed a treaty in 1994 between Ronald Reagan uh, and uh, Director Gorbachev in which we agreed that Ukraine would be a neutral buffer zone, that we would not push Ukraine into putting NATO offensive missiles aimed at Russia in their country. We're acting today in violation of that treaty, and nobody says anything about it. We have 370,000, I think it is, homeless veterans in this country, but we are shipping $10 billion, some of which may actually get to the war effort, to Ukraine. Uh, we know for a fact that some of that money is being stolen. 
the Senate defeats an amendment to ask an inspector general to track where our tax dollars are going. What senator could be against that? That makes no sense to me. So, uh, no, I think it is if one is a civil, civil libertarian of the left or the right, or if you are a libertarian, these are very, very dark times in America uh, as this administration walks us up to the brink of World War III. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and and I'm like what you've described as somebody who traditionally called myself a liberal. Now I'm afraid to even use the label because it just means something completely different than what my understanding of it always was. Um, I'm curious, you know, going forward, you know, Trump has announced his candidacy again in 2024. Um, do you think that Trump has a chance to win the nomination on the Republican side? I know that there's a lot of question regarding DeSantis. I, th I think uh, he's. In, yeah. I think he's. Uh, I think he's in the driver's seat. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, appeal and his strength in the grassroots of the Republican Party among non-elites remains extraordinarily strong. Uh, what percentage of the primary vote does he have a lock on? Is it forty-five? Is it fifty? Is it fifty-five? It's in that range. Uh, you know, uh, it is going to be very tough, in a, particularly if there's a multiple challengers to arrest the party at the grassroots from Trump. Can he win a general election? What did, what will the economy look like at the end of 2024? If you can answer that question with certainty, which no one can, uh, then you can determine whether Trump can win or not. It is feasible. Uh, I do think he'll be the nominee. I think it'll be a spirited fight for the nomination, but I think he will prevail. Uh, I think he may be the one candidate to take on this corrupted system. Uh, but it is uh, the one thing that's predictable about Donald Trump is he's completely unpredictable. Uh, and right. I think he's got to kind of drop back and run the same kind of guerrilla campaign he ran in 2016. He will not be the candidate of the Republican establishment. That's a plus. He will not be a candidate of Wall Street. That's a plus. He will not be the candidate of the defense contractors. That's a plus. Uh, he's got to push term limits very hard, in my opinion. Uh, he's got to come up with a better response to China, which is systematically buying up this country. Uh, you know, farmland, ranch land, toll plazas, bridges, harbors, tunnels, highways. Uh, I think there are a number of key issues here in which he would have resonance with the American people. Yeah, I would like to see, uh, is there anyone that's around him, maybe yourself or others, who are actually trying to push him back towards the campaign of 2016? You know, I, th I think that there was a big departure in 2020 both from him and even Bernie Sanders, who has also kind of had a similar message to Trump in 2016. And I noticed that they seem to go more culture war in 2020. And I don't think that resonates that well with the people that are on the ground, middle America, trying to survive. And now eggs are nine dollars for a dozen and we're spending a bunch of money in Ukraine. So is there are there people around Trump right now for this second this this uh, third run, I suppose, for president that are actually pushing more towards that populist, anti-war, anti-establishment message that he had in 2016 that worked? Uh, well, it's always been my policy not to discuss the content of conversations uh, I have with the president before he was president, while he was president, or now in his post-presidency. I'm happy to tell you he's in a good mood, that his health is good, that he's energized, that he's very focused, uh, and all those things are true. Uh, I do think that de facto he's going to learn that the party establishment that he propped up, many of whom he uh, endorsed many of whom that he elected, many of whom he ran, uh, raised money for, are not going to return the favor. So I think yeah. in the end, he has to run a more uh, anti-establishment uh, guerrilla campaign. He has the experience of four years uh, and the illicit and illegal dirty trick in which the full authority of the United States government and the capabilities of our intelligence agencies were used in an illicit plan, utilizing uh, fabricated evidence in the Steele dossier uh, in the CrowdStrikes report to rationalize an illegal coup through the Mueller investigation to remove a sitting president. But yeah. even at the end of the day, that investigation proved no evidence of Russian collusion. The claim that Paul Manafort gave poll numbers to a Russian uh, asset, uh, and that's the Russian collusion, is farcical. First of all, there the poll numbers in question were publicly published. They didn't come from Manafort. Manafort had no proprietary Trump campaign poll numbers at the time. Uh, and uh, this guy Kalimnik, who received the information, is far more likely a U.S. Uh, as, uh, intelligence asset uh, than a Russian asset. He worked previously for John McCain, uh, and uh, he was a regular informant 
to the uh, American embassy in Kiev. He was so prized as a source. His name is redacted in the cables in which uh, the information he provides to U.S. authorities are sent back to Washington. So uh, it is a it is a canard. Uh, and uh, this administration walks us to the brink uh, of war uh, and the Russophobia. Um, and again, yeah. I'm not a fan of Putin's. I mean, I had I had my own relatives mowed down by Russian tanks in Budapest in 1956. But this administration has a reckless foreign policy. It is reckless in Ukraine. Uh, it engenders the weakness engenders uh, more aggression by the Chinese regarding Taiwan, more aggression by Iran. The Russians and the Iranians are not natural allies. They, uh, the Russia has a, an Islamic uh, terrorism and extremist problem as we do. We have pushed the Russians into the hands of the Ukraine through this war policy, uh, into the hands of the Iranians, which is a very lethal and deadly combination. No, I, this administration, do they have a foreign policy? It's hard to say. <laughs> um, my audience cares a lot about Julian Assange, so I have to ask you uh, about Julian. What do you think should uh, happen uh, should, to him? He, I was writing op-eds for a pardon for Julian Assange back when Donald Trump was president. Julian Assange uh, is a journalist. The government has never provided any evidence or proof whatsoever that he is a foreign state actor. It was Mike Pompeo, who wants to run for president now, and hopes we all forget that, who said he was a foreign state actor. That's supposed to mean a Russian. There's no evidence that Julian Assange did anything other than what journalists do. Get accurate information and publish it. If I worked at the New York Times and the Washington Post, I'd be very concerned about this slippery slope. But notice they charged Assange not with crimes in connection with things that he published, but allegations that he had stolen a material which he didn't steal. He should be freed immediately. Every journalist in America should be concerned about this. No, he is not a Russian asset. No, he did not send me any stolen emails. Uh, no, I never had a direct uh, communication with him. This is all nonsense. And I stand with those many people who are demanding freedom for Assange. Why didn't Trump pardon him or drop the charges or uh, help him out in any way? I mean, he seemed to indicate that he was going to, and then he backed out. Many of us were just championing that idea. I mean, he would have won me over. I think he would have won many of us over and said, I that's it, You will. we will vote for you next time. I, I, can, I, can, I can answer your question quite simply. I think the former president became falsely convinced by some in his administration that some of the disclosures that were attributed to Julian Assange had caused the death of American servicemen. It's a lie. It's not true. It has never happened. But I think that the president, the former president was persuaded of that. I think that is the reason there was no pardon in the Assange case. I was praying that he would pardon Assange. I would have also pardoned Snowden, even though the cases are quite different. Right. Uh, and uh, it is uh, this ongoing persecution of Julian Assange uh, is outrageous. Um, I know you have to get going because you got your own show on Rumble that you're doing. And, you know, this is a Rumble exclusive show. So we're excited that you're here for us. You know, we're, we're glad, grateful for your appearance here today. Um, I do have to ask you, somebody wanted me to bring up your your Nixon tattoo. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you really have a tattoo of Nixon? Is that true? I do. I have a tattoo of Richard Nixon on my back about the size of a grapefruit. Let me explain it. Uh, it's not really a political statement. Uh, Nixon staged the greatest single political comeback in American history. He took a lot of hits and a lot of knocks, and he came back to uh, be someone who made the world a more peaceful place. He reached a strategic arms limitation with the Soviets. Uh, he opened the door to China. Uh, he ended the Vietnam War. He ended the military draft. He gave us the 18-year-old vote. He saved Israel from absolute annihilation in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. He desegregated the public schools. Uh, he launched the war on cancer. Uh, he, was a, he was a very resilient guy. Uh, every day when I see that tattoo in the mirror, I'm reminded that in life, when you get knocked down, when you suffer defeats, when you are dejected and disappointed and you're ready to give up, that's when you have to get back in the arena. Uh, so the story of Nixon is not an ideological story. He was pretty much a pragmatist. Uh, it's a story of resilience. Uh, it's a story of determination. It's a story of persistence. And therefore, it's an American story. And that's why I have the tattoo. There have been many suggestions that I get a tattoo of Donald Trump. I don't <laughs> intend to do that. Uh, I did say that I would consider adding uh, Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, and Trump to my tattoo of Nixon to have like a Mount Rushmore thing. 
But at this point, it's just an idea. I haven't decided to do it. All right, Roger. Well, um, this has been really a, a pleasure talking to you. I think that a lot of my uh, people in my audience would be very surprised. You know, I, I've got a lot of people from, like I said, the populist left who hear these types of conversations and become shocked that, oh, my gosh, I actually agree with this guy. And I think a lot of people right now are watching this interview thinking, I can't believe I'm agreeing with Roger Stone. I thought he was the Trump guy and I didn't agree with these people on the right. But here you uh, are. I'm, not, I'm a, more of a libertarian than I am a conservative. So I describe myself as a libertarian conservative. I'm a 30 year proponent of the legalization of cannabis, for example, which I think is uh, has medicinal benefits is far less dangerous than opioids. Uh, so people are often surprised. I'm very anti-war. Uh, the last vote I cast for Republican before Donald Trump was for uh, Dr. Ron Paul, who I voted for in the Florida primary. And then with the change of Florida law, I didn't change back to the Republican Party in time to be eligible to vote for Donald Trump uh, in 2016, or I would have. So the last Republican I voted for was an anti-war Republican. If I were in the U.S. Senate, I would say my record would be closest to Rand Paul. I'm a true hmm. believer, okay. I'm a civil libertarian, and I'm, I'm a non-interventionist. I'm not an isolationist, but I don't trust big government, and I'm, I'm anti-war. Yeah, I, I do like Rand Paul as well. I think he's one of my favorite senators also. So again, you know, a lot of people listening would be very surprised to agree with so much uh, with you, Roger. So thank you so much. All right, you've got to get off to your show, The Stone Zone on Rumble. Um, so we're going to let you go to that, Roger. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. God bless you and thank you. I know many of us are trying to get healthy again post pandemic because yes, I think the pandemic is over and we need to move on with our lives now. So I want to tell you guys about a new superfood product that I've been using to help make sure I get all the nutrients I need. It's called Field of Greens. It's a simple powder you can mix into a drink or sprinkle onto food. Now what makes Field of Greens different is it's not made with any extracts. It's actually made with real super high quality freeze dried organic fruits and vegetables. Now last night, I actually took a scoop and mixed it into my balsamic vinegar and olive oil salad dressing and then poured it on some mixed greens and chicken. Honestly, I was being so lazy. I didn't want to chop up a bunch of veggies and make a big nutritious salad, and yet I still got one thanks to Field of Greens, and it tasted great. So head to fieldofgreens.com and use promo code KIM to get 15% off your first order.